so much, Juanetta. I, I just want to say, uh, for those of you that don't know Tony Izzo, um, you haven't lived in Alaska. So everything related to energy, the oil, gas, now the electric uh, utility, uh, he has been a very um, strong advocate for and uh, certainly is very, very uh, knowledgeable of all the issues important to Alaskans. I remember sitting back on the Mayor's Energy Task Force with Tony during numerous meetings when we were talking about rolling blackouts and uh, look how far we have come. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I'm very much looking forward to his perspectives on how the utilities are gonna continue to work together and what those very important reliability standards are that are necessary, not only for the electric uh, utility industry, but also for the gas industry uh, going forward. So without further ado, um, Tony Izzo uh, is here to present, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, your, your presentation, and uh, hopefully we'll have some really good robust uh, questions for you after. Thank you, Tony. Well, uh, thank you, Mary Ann. Thank you, everybody. I'm here today, I look forward to talking to you all about the probably the least controversial energy related matter in in the rail belt or in Alaska today. I'd also like to take note that there are certainly uh, some real experts on the call or on the line here today, probably know a whole lot more uh, about the specifics and history of Bradley Lake. Than, than I do. I see Jim Posey, I see Kirk Warren uh, and, and others. So um, I look forward to them. Um, maybe we'll think about this like the uh, lifelines. So depending on the question, I might have to you know, ask the audience or phone a friend, we'll, you know, we'll see how that goes. So I've got just a few slides. Um, thank you, Winetta. We can go to the next slide. And I'm just going to hit some highlights. And as Marianne indicated, I'm, I'm really open to talking about anything related to this topic. I'm currently the, have been a member of the Bradley Lake Project Management Committee and I've been chair of the BPMC, uh, finishing up my second year right now. Uh, so what is the project? It's, it's located about 27 air miles from Homer. It's across Kachemak Bay. Um, it's a 120 megawatt facility, generates an average of 380,000. I've seen as much as an average of 386,000 megawatt hours of energy per year. Um, it's, uh, when it was built, it, it was connected into the existing grid. So there's only, the only transmission that was built with the project was to uh, connect that 20 miles to connect it to the, the existing grid. Each utility in the rail belt has an allocated share. Uh, that's based on their pro rata share of the total rail belt demand back in 1991. Uh, originally, Chugach had uh, 30% and now combined with the purchase of MLMP has their 26%. And so you'll see there that they're the largest percentage at 56.3%. Uh, Seward's the lowest percentage at 1%. Uh, give you an idea of the other utilities. Homer has 12%. MEA has 13.8%. Golden Valley has 17.9%. Project was uh, built from 86 to 91. Um, Alaska Energy is the owner or the owner's representative. It's a, it's a state-owned asset. Uh, and Homer Electric has been the operator. It, it is a, a, a contract through AEA to operate and, operate and maintain it. And I think they've done a, a very fine job over the, over the years. I would note that the project cost in 1991 was $328 million. Uh, if you were to adjust that for inflation in 2021 dollars, you're talking about 638 million in, in today's dollars. Go to the next slide, Renata. Uh, construction of the dam, 610 foot long, 125 foot high uh, uh, dam. Uh, the tunnel's three and a half miles, diameter of 11 feet. Um, 
the powerhouse contains two generators, each capable of producing 60 megawatts. And I, I think it's interesting to note that it was constructed with the capability to add a third unit. So it, it could be, um, again, depending on a variety of factors, we could expand it. From On 20 to 18, touch on it where that, that we have in our uh, mindset regarding uh, the potential future of the facility. We go to the next slide. So, hydro is the cheapest right now on the rail belt. It's four cents a kilowatt hour. Um, think about that in terms of the average in the South Central. Anchorage Bowl area, you're talking about 20 cents per kilowatt hour um, all in, and uh, that's delivered to a home. Uh, out of that 20 cents, typically about eight, seven, eight cents is uh, natural gas, uh, including transportation to, to, to the generator. Um, so you can see that it's, it's half the price at, at four cents. Um, wasn't always that way. I think at four cents, it was the highest price power uh, when it uh, when it came on and went commercial in '91. Um, compared to other uh, power, I mean, other factors I'd like to point out is that it's firm power. You you don't have to uh, as a renewable. It's very unique in that regard. Um, in unlike solar and wind, you don't have to worry about the wind stopping or becoming too strong. You don't have to worry about cloud cover. Um, and even on a rainy day, you can look at uh, the sky and say that free fuel is falling out of the sky. So um, it's a real positive. I think on the non-firm side of, of power that we have, um, MEA has a solar farm that's about 1, 1 1.2 megawatts. Uh, we purchased that, all of that power. I think the contract's about 30 years and it's at 85% of our avoided costs. So if we're paying um, uh, right now, I think our COPA or cost of power adjustment is just under seven cents. Uh, and so what we pay for that solar uh, power is gonna be 85% of that seven cents. I, on the other end of the spectrum, um, you have Fire Island Wind, which I believe is nine, nine and a half cents. Uh, power generated, as I said, four cents, uh, significant cost uh, uh, savings over fossil fuel, about half the cost of the fossil fuel right now. Uh, and uh, other benefits include uh, decrease uh, in cost of ratepayers, which we all want more of, and a, and a, a essentially carbon-free um, generation. Move to the next slide. Whenever. So what is the Bradley Lake Project Management Committee or BPMC? It's comprised of uh, those that are obligated, uh, thankfully obligated to uh, purchase all of the uh, uh, generation from Bradley Lake, as well as, so you, you'll see here, the five rail belt utilities as in addition to the, the owner's representative, Alaska Energy Authority. The chair does tend to rotate uh, I mentioned earlier, I'm in my second year. That's really at the will of the uh, committee. Um, I have no clue if starting in the next fiscal year who that next chair will be, but we typically have a process where it gets rotated around and the vice chair moves up to the chair. And I think it makes a lot of sense to have uh, a, a variation of, of uh, sitting in the chair that really sets the agenda um, and, and directs the uh, will of the, of the committee. Um, as you can see here, responsible for budgets, setting the direction, and we're foc focused on optimizing the benefits of Bradley Lake uh, power to the uh, 550,000 to 600,000 Alaskans that, that we serve, depending on how you do the math, but basically from Homer to Fairbanks. You can move to the next slide. So accomplishments in 2020, 2020 was a pretty unique year for uh, Bradley Lake. There, there's some very material accomplishments that, that happened uh, really in two areas. One is 
is uh, through AEA and their management of, of this construction. The expansion of Battle Creek was completed with a diversion of additional, an additional stream, the Battle Creek stream into the lake. It, it does add more water to produce more power. Um, it doesn't increase the capacity of the turbines, which are still at, at 120, or does it impact the limitation of the single inner tie at about 75 megawatts? But it does optimize the current capital investment using the existing infrastructure that's there, the existing generation, the existing dam. To give you a, just a general sense, um, and I might be jumping ahead of my presentation, but Battle, uh, Bradley Lake uh, adds 37,300 megawatt hours to the number I had you know, uh, originally in the earlier slide, I said 386 thousand megawatt hours a year on an average annual basis. This diversion adds 37,300, approximately 9.7% increase in, in the water or fuel. Um, so now we're at a total of 423,300 megawatt hours and the ribbon cutting and commercial operation of that project was essentially on time. Uh, it cost in the low $40 million range and uh, was completed last summer. So we look forward to the uh, first full year of, of operation there. Uh, that diversion, Battle Creek diversion, represents, a, as I said, 9.6% increase overall. And how does that compare as I look at these kinds of things, at least at my level compared to the overall generation in the rail belt. So we're talking about 423,300 megawatt hours of firm power coming from Bradley Lake. That represents 8.8% of a average annual year's total generation on the rail belt, which is 4,787,000 you know, and a few hundred. So by completing the Battle Creek diversion, we increased Bradley Lake from 8% of the total generation on the rail bell to 8.8%. Um, the, the Battle Creek diversion itself um, included a uh, diversion of a stream. It was a concrete dam, three miles of road constructed, 60 inches, 60 inch diameter, uh, high density polyethylene uh, pipeline. I mean, think about that. If you're five foot or less, um, you could stand up inside of it. And no, I can't stand up inside of it, but I'm pretty close. Uh, you, uh, it's interesting to me, having come from a natural gas utility background originally, it's the exact same material that's used in uh, gas distribution uh, pipes in the streets, as well as the service lines coming into your house, which might be one inch in diameter, this thing is 60 inches in diameter. And as I mentioned earlier, the cost was in the low $40 million range. The second thing we accomplished that's of significance in 2020 was the purchase of the SSQ or Soldotna to Sterling to Quartz Creek, but think of it as a 50 mile section of line that was previously owned by Homer Electric. Uh, the that's really only purpose. In fact, we need that line uh, because its sole purpose was really to move the power from the project uh, to everyone north of the Kenai Peninsula. Uh, the, uh, I, if you, you may have heard me in other settings or with other groups talk about this in, in the last year, year and a half, but Swan Lake Fire uh, took that line down for three months uh, and, and it says here 10 million, I can tell you it was more like 12.4 million um, is what the cost, the additional incremental cost over the Bradley power that we could not receive. Yeah, the utilities north of the peninsula, their ratepayers north of the peninsula paid over $12 million uh, extra for the natural gas that uh, we needed to generate that power we could not, we could not access. And so in reviewing that entire uh, situation, uh, we determined that, uh, and with the help of certainly AEA and the Department of Law determined that 
it could be included as part of the project, that this line was critical to the project. It's what we refer to as project required work, uh, which is a, a definition, um, specific definition that, that is indicative of something necessary for the uh, project to continue. The battle diversion was not project required work. We just decided it was a good thing to do. Uh, project required work is something that if you don't do, uh, you won't receive the power. And so we realized that um, all the utilities came together actually pretty quickly and determined that let's purchase the line from Homer Electric. Uh, we all will now share, including Homer Electric, in the cost to operate and maintain it going forward. Uh, but now it's just, it's owned by AEA. It's just part of the Battle of the Bradley Lake project. So maintenance on it, operation of it, upgrading it is something that will be uh, part of uh, any BPMC or Bradley Lake uh, project uh, work going forward. Uh, we purchased the line for a little over $13 million. Um, and it says here in the last bullet, it, it does ensure our ability to maintain and operate it going forward rather than having one utility be responsible. Uh, we can all throw our resources at uh, keeping that line in in service. Um, next slide, Winetta. So what's next? Um, investigating further system upgrades is something I think the BPMC has always done. But I will say that in my, say, six or seven years on uh, the BPMC that there is a renewed focus and interest in uh, further maximizing the flexibility and deliverability of the power. I mentioned earlier that the inner tie is, you know, having a single inner tie is uh, problematic. Obviously, we all saw that in uh, 2019 with the Swan Lake fire um, and uh, with the disruption of that. Um, we have a number of, uh, uh, quite a few actually permits, including the wildlife refuge. So there are federal and, and private lands that we have to go through with that line. It had been intended years ago to build a second line, which would be the most prudent thing to do, um, except for the fact that we just don't have the rate base or the number of consumers to justify the, uh, the cost to do so. So let me try to break that down or unpack it a little bit. So you have a generation facility that is rated at 120. You, you would never run it at that, but you could get pretty close. You have a single transmission line that we limit the operation to 75 megawatts because that's just for safety purposes. Uh, there have been some times where it'll get up to 90, which is not something that we're all real proud of, um, it, it can represent a threat to the integrity of that line. And so some have often believed and stated out loud that, well, why would you, you know, why would you build something at 120 megawatts or why would you rely on a single intertie because then you can't get the power. And that's just not true. There's a nuance here. We can get all of the power from Bradley Lake. We just can't get it when it would be the most efficient. Um, so there isn't any water that gets wasted. Yes, there are spills, but they're very rare. And there are other reasons why that might occur. Um, you know, mechanical reason, operational reason. Uh, it could be a weather event. Uh, but for the most part, there is no waste of that, of that energy. Um, the, the kind of the waste is, is that if I could get more of it when I wanted it, I could increase the efficiency of my thermal generation. And so the goal is that we, we try to find ways to be more efficient while keeping rates to ratepayers um, at the current level. And, and that's a challenge because all things like healthcare and other costs uh, are going up. Um, but there's a way that we believe that we can do that. And I'll just give you some examples. The, the, uh, the BPMC has agreed to a list of projects that we are currently pursuing. And so we're in the evaluation phase, but these are projects that we've prioritized. 
one of the first ones is to upgrade that transmission line we just we just purchased and you're talking about 50 miles or so that operates all of it operates at 115 kv that section of line that was impacted by the swan lake fire is responsible for the majority of line loss or a high percentage of line loss um, it really needs to be upgraded to 230 kv and, and that will increase uh, our ability to take more be a little bit more flexible but you really need a second line to so the things that we're looking at is first upgrading that transmission line, we're looking at approximately a $70 million project to bring that from 115 to 230. We're looking at another uh, diversion. I can't really speak about that, but the Battle Creek diversion uh, represented a 9.6% increase. Uh, we're looking at, an, we're starting to explore another uh, diversion. Uh, we are, we have raised again um, the second inner tie and we plan to, uh, if all things come together, we plan to initiate an EIS and a routing study. Um, and the fourth one is to raise the spillway four to seven feet, which uh, would add another 5,000 megawatt hours or so. Um, all of these things need to be looked at in concert uh, for example, uh, unfortunately, the most expensive uh, and the longest lead time, most capital intensive, would be a second, a second line. Uh, but it's about the definition of luck, as I like to say, the definition of luck. And I think I'm quoting, uh, probably paraphrasing, uh, if not butchering Mark Twain, is when opportunity meets preparation is the definition of luck. And so we. We wanna be prepared. We're hearing an awful lot about federal policies to decrease carbon. Um, we have opportunity if we needed to, to put in another 60 megawatt generation for, uh, uh, generator at this location. Uh, would we do that with the current single inner tie today? It really doesn't make any sense to do that because I, I don't have the redundancy needed to uh, to be able to take advantage of that. And so, uh, you know, we're looking at all of these things again in concert. Um, that I think, you go to the next slide, is my very brief presentation. I'm happy to take questions or have some of the, some of the real experts on this uh, at the meeting to, to weigh in with their sage advice. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tony, Marianne, do you wanna start off with your question? Sure. Um, thank you. Uh, okay. I can't start my video, but that's okay. I'll ask the question. <laughs> uh, you know, Tony, one of the things that I think you always have to look at when you have an asset like Bradley Lake is, um, you know, what are the opportunities or challenges associated with privatization of such an entity? And is it something that is still being considered? Um, great question. I would uh, I would say, Marianne, in my experience, there have been times when it is on the table and there are times when it's not. It seems to wax and wane. At, right now, there does not seem to be an interest on behalf of the uh, uh, of the owner or the participants in in looking to uh, uh, sell the asset. Um, I think. Uh, I think we'd have to consider the necessary return on equity that would have to be required. And we do have some opportunities. The bonds on the project are gonna be paid off here in just a few months. And, and ratepayers are required under the original agreements to, uh, and, and the project was paid for with 50% uh, equity from the state and 50% debt. Um, and once that debt is paid off, we, we have to continue through rates to pay what are referred to, the, the, the formal definition is excess payments. Um, and so we're working very hard to ensure that those excess payments, which are no higher than what we're, members or rent rate payers are paying today, uh, but they approximate uh, about $12 million a year. We wanna put those dollars to work uh, through primarily uh, not-for-profit business model of cooperatives 
to leverage what we have there already. Excellent, thank you. Thanks, Marianne, thanks, Tony. Um, Tony, um, with uh, creating a, a, a secondary or redundant transmission line for the SQ line, do you have a, a routing and a sense of the cost per mile for uh, construction or something like that? Well, typically, typically transmission, just as a rule of thumb, is about a million a mile. That's on land. Um, what we're looking at here is, is $200 million plus. Uh, routing is really going to have to be, you know, that's why we would conduct a routing study. It had been studied in the past. It, it was um, going to come across the inlet over to uh, Beluga. Uh, maybe that's the best routing study uh, maybe our best route, maybe it's not. Uh, we did not, when that analysis was conducted, we did not have the concerns raised about beluga whales. Um, and so really everything's on the table, that southern intertie today that includes that SQ line. We, maybe we double circuit it in the same right of way. That doesn't necessarily eliminate the uh, fire risks um, but it, it, again, it's going to be a value proposition of what's the most economic way to make something happen while at the same time, as utilities, we deal with this. Uh, we, 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 are, we have a standard of service in Alaska that's at much greater risk, in my opinion, than anywhere in the lower 48. I, I would refer to it as like third world country plus. And, and the rail belt grid, we refer to it as a grid, is really like a 300 plus mile extension cord in comparison. Um, anywhere else, you would, you would have that double circuited all, all the way. And, and the challenge is, is that, you know, we're, number one, we're not required to do that, but the impact of rates would be tremendous. And the increased reliability um, in, in terms of surveying membership and saying, you, you know, you now have, instead of many years ago, where you might have an outage for three or four days, you might have a windstorm. Um, they used to last very long. My own utility, the 2018 7.1 earthquake, we had everybody restored in 12 hours with all kinds of damage. And if you were to say, are, you know, are you willing to pay X amount more per month um, for, you know, for that second line, we're very likely to hear no, no way. Uh, so we have to find creative ways to do it. Maybe there are opportunities with some of the federal infrastructure uh, money that's being talked about right now. And again, all of those things are on the table being evaluated. Right. Thank you. Um, Bernie, do you have any questions for Tony? Uh, yeah. Uh, Tony, could you talk a little bit more about the bonds that are supposed to be uh, coming due um, in a couple of months? Uh, with the interest rates being so low now, have uh, has the committee or the owners and uh, the members uh, decided they might want to um, refinance uh, those bonds uh, or reissue bonds at a lower rate? Uh, I'm just uh, curious what the, the feel is right now on that. Sure, uh, Bernie, the bonds will be paid off here in a couple of months. Uh, the payments continue. Remember the state put up the equity for it. And so we're required to continue to pay uh, for that uh, at the same annual rate. So, so rates don't go up. It's just that you'll continue, the utilities collectively will continue to pay 12 million plus per year that, that was determined to go into a, uh, like a rail belt transmission fund. And so that's what we're looking at in terms of how do we leverage those dollars? And part of leveraging it is taking advantage of the low interest rates. And mm -hmm. we're working all of that, you know, all utilities are at the table, mutually interested along with AEA, who is really in my time as chair has been a great, you know, a great partner uh, with with the utilities, we could not have gotten the Battle Creek diversion. Certainly, could not have turned around in six months the purchase uh, financing of the uh, of the SSQ line. Great. Um, 
Oh, okay, thank you. Bernie, did you have anything else? Any follow-up? Uh, no, uh, not at this time. Oh, okay, great, thanks. Uh, just as a reminder to everybody online, you can submit your questions through the chat, or if you wanna use the raise your hand feature, I'm happy to call on you that way as well. And uh, Marianne has a question for you, Tony. Yeah, um, Tony, you know, you look at the benefits of um, Bradley Lake, you look at the benefits of Aklutna, clearly uh, hydro has been a very important part of the resource mix. Uh, given your background and uh, looking at kind of the forward looking vision, what can we do related to gas? I mean, our generators run on gas, okay? And uh, they are the backstop for everything and uh, it's what we need. Where do we need to be on a forward looking basis to help <laughs> reduce the cost of energy in South Central? Okay, so I know this is off of Bradley Lake a little bit, but I'm still calling upon him. <laughs> <laughs> it's related. Yeah, um, you're, you're, I think what you're referring to is really the uh, fuel supply portfolio and Hydro makes up an important part of it. As I mentioned, it's, depending on the utility for MEA, it's 10% of, uh, of, of our demand is met with, with Bradley Lake. Um, a, a Klutna, you know, we get another, uh, well, we can say LNLP, we'll get another maybe 15 megawatts out of that. Um, so I could speak to both sides of it there. Uh, the industry, the industry is is highly concerned. I mean, as, as a buyer of natural gas in the inlet, I can I can only convey to you the things that I hear myself. Not so it's not hearsay to me, but I'm passing it along. So I guess that makes it hearsay. Uh, is the natural natural gas is uh, would be a a win win in the interior, for example, compared to the uh, particulate issues there. So from an environmental perspective, it would be great there. Uh, with the new federal administration, we're hearing an awful lot about carbon zero power generation by 2035. We haven't seen anything yet, but we're hearing that there will be some you know, legislation uh, uh, supported by the White House that would require all of us to be, uh, to have essentially no thermal generation. So, so um, that's quite a a daunting task. It's one of those, those, you know, in addition to just keeping the lights on, how we would do that with a small consumer base that we have in Alaska in a 14, less than 14 years is a daunting challenge. And it does concern me because you, you know, you have a, a market in Cook Inlet that uh, has unintentionally received some, you know, terrible, uh, inputs over the years, um, not allowing contracts to be uh, connected to lower 48 has resulted in, in seven and a half dollar gas instead of two and a half dollar gas. Um, it resulted in uh, the major parties, Marathon, Chevron, Unical, and all of the 10 plus new players that were brought in by the tax credits, they've all left. And, and I hear folks referring to Hillcorp as you know, being stuck with this monopoly. And I, I personally wish there were more, I think producers, I think Hillcorp wishes there were more. Um, uh, but I'm very, very thankful that they're, that they're here. And I really worry about the day they decide that they don't want to be anymore um, because I don't, yet know how we could, uh, how we as a state could afford the transition that rapidly. It, it, you, you know, you're talking probably a billion plus dollars to make that, that change. Uh, and you could probably multiply that by some factor uh, depending on the new portfolio. On the other side of the equation, I think it's just a reality that you know, as technology evolves, certainly technologies are coming down in price. There's uh, membership. I, I can tell you for MEA, for instance, in our membership surveys, 70 plus percent say they want to see more renewables. And when we ask, well, you know, how many of you would pay for more, you, you know, that number immediately gets cut in half. 
And then when you ask the next question of, well, how much would you pay? You, you know, you, you can cut that in half again and you might see $5 a month. Um, and, and we're actually on a voluntary basis, how many are really willing to, to contribute to that kind of a transformation. Uh, I, I'd also just, you know, step on the other side of the, the uh, discussion and say that diversification of fuel supply is very thing, and we have that here. Uh, Marianne, uh, I came to Alaska in 99 and I was shocked then, I'm still shocked today. But I came from a gas utility that had pipelines from three other states. That wasn't good enough, so we built one to Canada. That wasn't good enough, so we had a propane air mixer. That wasn't enough reliability, so we constructed two LNG um, uh, peaker plants uh, where we imported back in the early 80s LNG from Algeria, actually. Um, it came into Massachusetts. It was trucked down to New Jersey. We had two different facilities where it was offloaded all summer long. We brought it in. And in the winter, uh, if any one or more of those pipelines was impacted, we knew that we could provide continuous service. And <clears throat> I don't mean to be an alarmist. It's just the reality that if you... Um, if we had an earthquake or a situation that took out the Glen Highway, I don't know how you get people from Anchorage out of the, you know, you're not driving out of the state. It's just one road. If, if one bridge goes down, <clears throat> you're done. You're, you know, you're looking at helicopters and we have one gas line that, that, that circles the inlet and you take that down and uh, my utility, my, you know, prior to my time determined to, build the dual fuel power plant where it's got five days of diesel fuel um, and we could you know we keep the lights on in in the valley second largest population center in the state um, uh, so and and again I mentioned like the one transmission line and and that's just the reality of where we live we just don't have the the, the economy or the population to afford the redundancy that uh, other than kind of just above a third world country. Right. Absolutely excellent, Tony. Thank you so much. And I mean, I, I, I think we could have these discussions on Bradley Lake, on the wonderful benefits of hydro, but until we bring in the complete resource mix, as you just did, we have a very narrow picture of where we're at and where the expectation is where we have to go on a forward-looking basis. Yeah, I would, <clears throat> I would just add to that in closing that um, we as a utility, especially as cooperatives, we are completely indifferent to the type of fuel. Now, certainly we want the lowest emissions, the best for the environment, but as a certificated monopoly, we are required to provide the essential service. I've seen utilities in the lower 48 prior to coming to Alaska who, who were really bad actors and were not following safety protocols and they created some horrendous situations. Uh, and their certificates were pulled. They, they lost that right to be the monopoly. And so you know, on one side, we have that uh, very serious responsibility. And, and on the other side, we're very indifferent to, you know, economically indifferent. I would much prefer if, if I had all, all hydro and I idled my thermal power plant, uh, I would be happy to cut rates uh, 40, 50%. I think that would be great for the economy. And it does not in any way damage the uh, financial health of the utility. So we're all for it. Um, I, I just have yet to see, I mean, other than the solar farm, um, I have yet to see anything economic come through the door, but wind, solar, tidal, geothermal, would love to have them would love to have them uh, because it would lower rates. Um, it would be less uh, carbon emissions um, and it would diversify a, a fuel supply portfolio that's as at risk as we are 
uh, overall with the one bridge, one road, one gas pipeline, one transmission line kind of a state that we live in. Thank you, Marianne and Tony. Um, uh, just a reminder again to the audience, you can submit your questions through chat or you can use the raise your hand feature. I will call on you. Um, Tony, you alluded to a uh, potential infrastructure bill, federal infrastructure bill. And I'm just wondering if you can speculate or um, maybe get out your um, wish list, whether from a Bradley Lake management uh, perspective or from your MEA perspective, what would you be hoping to see in that federal infrastructure bill? Well, transmission is number one. Um, one of the things that we've done well that we're actually criticized for the most is the distributed generation that has been built in the rail belt. Now, some you will hear, and I hear it watching gavel to gavel, you know, the utilities spent one and a half billion dollars on new generation. And, you know, we have to make sure that something like that doesn't happen again. I, I hear those kinds of statements. And I can tell you that just from the 2018 earthquake, that if we had relied on one utility for generation in one location, we would have gone black. Um, uh, the fact that that now uh, with the distributed generation, we burn 30% less gas, that's a real positive. Um, we were able to keep power on. If the gas line went down, I could keep the valley uh, lit. And instead of uh, hundreds of C-130s coming in to take Alaskans to someplace warm, um, as long as the road and the bridge are open, you could come to the valley um, uh, during a crisis like that. Um, so what I would say, Winetta, is you know, the generation has, is new, improved, efficient. What we really need at this point is, I would say, a combination of two things, fuel security and um, transmission. If, if we could build transmission, uh, if we could double circuit, meaning have a second transmission line from the Kenai to South Central and a second transmission line from South Central North to Fairbanks, whether that be the road belt project that connects in Copper Valley Electric through, through um, Glen Allen, Toke, um, we would have redundancy that was now similar to the lower 48, maybe not as good, but similar. And, um, and what that would facilitate is the ability to move uh, the lowest cost power to the demand anywhere on that, on that grid. It, it also would help, MEA with its unique generation can, um, we purchase spilled wind from Fire Island, we have purchased spilled wind from uh, uh, Delta Wind up north. Um, so those are examples of some efficiencies we're able to take advantage of now, but we're just scratching the surface of what we could do if if we had that if we had significant investment in transmission and i'm talking about probably you're, you're talking on an order of magnitude of 500 million plus to do that all right well a uh, uh, final call for questions from our audience uh, oh i see bernie raising his hand call on bernie uh yeah tony uh following up on the natural gas um situation is having a just one line uh you know doyon is looking more reasonable now if they're mined up there than they have in the past it's a, it's a really good article um uh, in the journal this this week and uh one of the things is they want to spend i think 250 million dollars to put a um uh, uh transmission line up there the natural gas transmission line up there uh and could that, has the rail belt utilities been interested in uh, working with uh, Doyon on this to have a, another line that uh, can get gas up uh, in case the bridge did go out or something happened? And, and following that up, if they do put this line in, uh, it's very possible that they would be importing uh, natural gas, which I know is is a heartburn for any Alaskan, but it's something that could easily happen. And then they would have to have storage for that uh, 
And I guess my question is, is Rail interested in working with them to uh, get a larger storage thing just in case something happens? Or I don't know, what's your thoughts on it? I guess this is my bottom line. And, and it's out in the future, <clears throat> what's going to happen? But I was just curious. Yeah, I think, Bernie, we, we, I certainly, I can speak for MEA and, and I think I, you know, I can guess pretty closely with my counterparts that we would be very interested in any of those kinds of things that are going to provide the, our ability to uh, complete our mission under our CPCNs, our, our certificate, uh, in the most efficient and cost-effective way we can. And really there's no, uh, like I said earlier, um, if somebody wanted to put in a, a LNG uh, storage and vaporizer uh, for peaking purposes, if, you know, if it was propane air, if it was additional storage. And we're looking at all of those kinds of things, including battery storage is another area of technology that we're very interested in, um, in an effort to reduce cost and increase that third world plus uh, reliability that we have. So uh, I'm not in any discussions with Doyon at this point, but it's something we're watching. Hey, Tony, this is Mary Ann. I, I'm going to throw one final question at you here. Um, can I kind of get your impression on the Susitna Dam and does it represent uh, a viable option to a 2036 carbon free mandate? And if so, you know, if so, all of these projects and opportunities and carbon-free mandates come at a cost to the end users, your customers. Yeah, they really do. It's, it's not about liking one fuel more than another um, at all. It's, it's, it's how do we accomplish, you know, the, what's in the, what it takes to facilitate execution of our responsibility under our certificate um, in, in the most cost-effective way possible. So if I found a cheaper way that caused more outages, then I've failed. Um, specific to Susitna Watana, you know, we're talking about these mega projects like a gas line from the North Slope or Susitna Watana really will take a vision by the state and a commitment that, that uh, extends beyond a a term of office, so, uh, a, a four year, six year, you know, whatever the term is. That's, you know, and, and you know this better than I, of course, but um, that's what it would really take. And what, you know, history has shown and what I've witnessed in, you know, my 20 plus years is that we kind of waffle around, run to the next shiny thing. Um, and um, uh, sometimes even, uh, uh, snatch defeat from the jaws of victory, uh, so to speak. And uh, I've seen that with the cooking let tax credits happen. Uh, I, you know, I've seen it myself a few times. And so, it, you know, MEA, my one utility is not going to be in any way have a deciding factor in what's going to happen at a Susitna Watana um, facility, even if the state was saying they were going to go forward with it we would have to look at it just like a gas line as any, you know, there's an obligation uh, maybe to be a little bit more clear under a prior administration's gas line proposal. They would come to my office and say, so when this gets here, you know, you're just going to convert everything over to, you know, over to this North Slope gas. And I would say, so how much does that cost? Well, we're going to get it really cheap, uh, but the transportation is going to be, you know, $12. And, and I would, I would look at it and say, there's, I mean, if we were to trade places, you, you know, the, the party on the other side who's trying to represent this as logical would realize that they would have to go down to the commission and get approval for paying for something that was 50% more than what you had in your own backyard. And, and that just doesn't, you know, that just doesn't fly. Uh, and, and so it strikes me often that we don't seem to uh, connect that into a macro view type of a conversation with a, with a commitment to go forward with something. I think we could have done any of those mega projects.
if you know if we had the will. Um, but it's it's like anything else. I think we have the cook inlet market that we deserve. Absolutely, it's unfortunate. <laughs> Uh, okay. All right. Well, I don't see any more questions. Um, I will just add one one final personal comment since we're just a week out from the 57th anniversary of the 1964 Great um, Alaska Good Friday earthquake that um, there were so many circumstances there that were, uh, despite the devastation, that were so fortunate for us in terms of the time of year and um, moving into uh, a late spring and a construction season where it was possible to do some recovery and not deal with some of the catastrophic circumstances. And it just, listening to you today, Tony, reminds me of um, how still profoundly vulnerable we are as a state. And um, even though we, we live with uh, great convenience and comfort today in comparison to 1964, we still have that very profound level of vulnerability. So. Yeah, I appreciate that. I don't think there's a reason that we should all, you know, not sleep tonight. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's just the reality though. And I think as long as you accept that reality and you can work collect collectively to address it, I, I don't think anybody's conf intentionally conflicts with that. But what we see is, is you know, conflict that stalls any progress. Uh, we're very lucky. We, you know, we are, are very different than Texas and ERCOT. <clears throat> On the other hand, I think we have more risks. And, um, um, uh, but we are a group that is familiar with subarctic climates and seismicity. And I think if they had either one of those down there, it would have been a lot worse. And, and Winetta also just, uh, you know, I see, I see Jim Posey and David Lockhart and Kirk Warren. And, you know, I'm, I've been around long enough that I would welcome them to weigh in and tell me what I got wrong or <laughs> add to something that, you know, correct me with a fact or two on Bradley Lake yeah. or anything else. Yeah. You know, to Tony, I'm only interested in, are you guys going to pursue in the rail belt, the modular nuclear reactors? Well, Jim, I believe that that, and <clears throat> I go to this MIT program uh, mostly once a year for power CEOs, and uh, you, you, you know, you're right there watching uh, the, their nuclear program, their fusion program, their, their solar and battery uh, PhDs, and <clears throat> nuclear is clearly the uh, most ready, safe technology that would take us to carbon free. In, in the time frame or closest to the time frame we're hearing from the, the new federal administration. Uh, I don't know any of us that are uh, looking at that right now. I mean, it's on the radar. Um, there is a uh, public perception that is uh, quite a hurdle um, around nuclear. <clears throat> and we're really thankful for Senator Murkowski's support and you know, in, in terms of, of that technology as well. Uh, again, if there is a federal mandate, uh, we will definitely have to, yeah, I think that would be just probably first on the list, but I, I think you'd end up with a debate that could last longer than the uh, 14 years we have to get there. We'll see. And Winetta, this, this is Kirk. I will say Tony's being just a little too humble um, in, in passing credit around for people that understand the rail belt. He's been a fabulous leader of the uh, Bradley Lake Project Management Committee. We're lucky that he's been chairing that committee for the last few years. Um, and I'm happy to say, I can think of nothing that needs correcting. It was a fabulous presentation, Tony, and thank you for giving it. Yeah. Yeah, Kirk, you remind me of one thing. You know, there was some longstanding litigation over the wheeling of uh, power across that line. And... <clears throat> We settled all of that last year quietly uh, yeah. with the purchase of that line. And so there, currently today, uh, there is no litigation between any, uh, ongoing litigation between any rail belt utility that there, there are no matters outstanding that are, you know, in a court somewhere. Okay, well, um, before I turn this back to uh, Marianne, uh, again, thank you, Tony, for, um, for your presentation today. I just wanted to uh, remind folks of what's coming up next. 
Um, we do have uh, Mira Kohler next week, Friday the uh, April 9th. Uh, Mira Kohler will be speaking about the uh, power cost equalization program and um, just a couple of other things coming up. Uh, we will, uh, uh, in the fiscal policy uh, study group, be uh, talking about, um, we've actually had a, a schedule change here. Uh, April 9th will be uh, Musin Gatabi with uh, Institute of Social and Economic Research talking about the Alaska economy. On April uh, 16th, we'll be talking about Alaska budget choices. And on April 21st, we have the 15th Annual Alaska Asset Review. Mead Treadwell, Craig Richards um, will be our, our Alaska speakers. And then we have two guest speakers, Eileen Norcross and Olivia Gonzalez with the Mercatus Center, who will be talking about the state's um, financial condition. And then coming up on Wednesday, May 12th, we'll have a program on the uh, carbon dividend plan uh, that's jointly proposed by the Climate Leadership Council and Americans for Carbon uh, Dividends. Um, it's a, uh, a bipartisan plan authored jointly by James Baker and the late George Schultz. And uh, we had an earlier presentation by them here in the Energy Policy um, Study Group last year. And this is uh, essentially a, an update and repeat on that for our larger uh, community in Commonwealth North. So uh, think about those. And with that, let me uh, turn back to Marianne for any uh, final closing comments. Marianne? Great, thank you so very much. Tony, thank you. Your, your presentation was not only informative, interesting, but um, also gave us a little bit of a look into that future. I want to follow up on something that Juanetta said. Um, you know, she remind us, reminded us that today is Good Friday, the Good Friday earthquake. Tony, you certainly weave the thread of reliability through your presentation as well. And the need um, when we have this single point of failure throughout, you know, South Central. Um, is there someone uh, that you could suggest, and I, I don't need a name today, but I, I think from a utility perspective, I think we should have an energy forum focused on reliability, the need for redundancy, the need for an appropriate mix of resources that fuel our electric grid. Um, uh, should we have the issues that we saw not only in Texas, but we've seen in California, we've seen these single point of failures and reliability has to be at the forefront. I mean, it's great to have all these objectives, these carbon neutral objectives, and um, but reliability in Alaska is not a nice to have, it's a mandate. So Tony, I would appreciate you working uh, with Winetta and myself and Bernie and seeing if we could have someone address that very important issue to our energy coalition. Sure. And um, I think <clears throat> I think with that, Marianne, I just, you know, a shout out to all the people that are actually doing the keeping the lights on. Um, it, it's certainly not me. That's not my day to day. But, you know, we've we've got some great folks that work for the utilities that do just a tremendous job of, of working together. Uh, you know, the utilities earn the reputation of not getting along, but I have to tell you that was really at the top. That's long gone now, you know, many years away. Um, and the folks that are actually doing the work, running the power plants, repairing uh, and building uh, power lines, uh, work extremely well together. And I, you know, I think we're very lucky. I know I'm grateful for the folks that I work with. Um, yeah, I think you really have a topic there that's of interest. It's like, what is the cost? What level of reliability would we want? And what would the cost be? It, I think once you have those, you know, at least some sense of uh, ballpark for those, you could determine uh, methods by which we get there. Okay, well, and uh, thank you to, uh, to everybody uh, again uh, for joining us. Marianne, any, any other final words? Or? Oh, everyone have a wonderful uh, Easter weekend, uh, happy spring, and uh, look forward to seeing everyone next Friday. Great, thanks. And um, also just to everybody online, any uh, suggestions for future sessions are always welcome. Please feel free to email me at exec, E-X-E-C, at commonwealthnorth.org. With that, we're adjourned. Thanks so much. Thanks, Renata. Good job, Tony. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.